Good morning. Good morning. I'm glad you're all here today. And we are done with our financial series that we are doing the last three weeks. The next three weeks, we're just going to do some random sermons from the Bible, some scriptural stuff, and then we'll have a new series after that. Today, we're talking about how to not feel guilty, how to not feel condemned. Um, there, there was a time my wife and I went to Chili's, and we were sitting down to eat, and we noticed an older couple that was kind of near us at a table, and they just looked super depressed. Have you ever seen some old people out to eat, and it just looks like they hate their life? They're sitting there, and they're not talking. They're not communicating. They're looking down. It's like they don't even care that they're there. And so my wife and I are like, gosh, we hope we don't end up like them. And Meadow says, no, we'll never be like that. We're fun. We're exciting. We have conversations with each other. And we ordered, and then the waitress went over to them, and the lady ordered the exact same thing that Meadow ordered. And I was like, "Uh oh And then the dude ordered the same thing that I ordered. And she was like, "Uh uh-oh. Now we're feeling like this is not good. I was like, Meadow, that is a sign. This is not good. We're going to end up old and boring. And she says, she says, no, no, no. We're not going to end up like that because we pray before we eat. And they didn't pray. And at that very second, they both bowed their heads and prayed. (laughs) Oh, man. For a moment, we felt condemned, like our future was doomed, but it wasn't true. Have you ever felt condemned, even though you shouldn't feel condemned? Oh, man, I know some of you used to be in deep addiction, and then you got sober, and a police car drives by you now, and still to this day, you're like, oh, no, like you're kind of freaking out. I know some of you ain't never even been in jail, and a policeman pulls behind you, and you're like, oh, no, I need a bail. You're just feeling the condemnation already. Maybe you had really harsh parents. You could never measure up. Even if you got an A in class, it wouldn't give you relief because you knew they'd find something wrong with you. Maybe you got a terrible boss. If you leave early, he'll yell at you. If you stay late, he'll be mad you didn't clock out on time. If you leave exactly at the right second, he'll be like, well, you didn't get all your stuff done. And here's the truth. People feel like that's Christianity a lot of the time because they don't come to church and they feel like we're just all about getting down on people. And then they come to church and they feel guilty because we talk about what they've done wrong. And they've asked God, maybe you've asked God a hundred times, please forgive me for that sin, but you still feel guilty about something you did in the past, even though it's over and gone years ago, you still, when you think of it, it feels like a burden on you. Let's write this down. Sometimes I feel condemned for my sins, even when I don't need to. So many times, Instead of feeling freedom from the sermon here, you you feel ashamed. God has forgiven you for your sin, but you're still carrying around so much guilt. And you'd be able to say, yes, God's forgiven me, but it still feels bad when you think about your past. Today, we're going to answer a very, very important question. This comes from 1 John 3.19. This is how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. Whose presence? This is, we're talking about God's presence, okay? How do we set our heart at rest in the presence of God? We're going to talk about that today. So instead of feeling guilty, you're going to learn how to be at peace. And by the way, the word heart here, when it's talking about setting your heart at rest, the word heart in the original Greek that the Bible is written in doesn't just mean your feelings. Heart meant your thoughts, your feelings, and the will, the intention of your actions. So this is like everything about you. And you want to be able to set everything about you at rest, have peace with God. We're going to take all that shame and guilt you got rolling around in your mind, your emotions, all your past, and we're specifically going to talk about how to be at rest with no more guilt, no more fear. And when you do that, you're going to find out in this scripture we're going to read that you gain some other things that are really important. Now, if you don't listen to this today, you're going to leave here. You're still going to carry the guilt from your past, and you're not going to get the bonus points that you see in the rest of the verses. So please grab your Bible. If you got one like this on a chair near you somewhere to page 987, okay? This is 1 John chapter 3. Verse 19 to 24. Once you, once you get to that page number, you'll find uh, that big three. So the Bible's weird. It's got like numbers all over the place. Big numbers are chapter numbers. Little numbers are verse numbers. So chapter 3, verse 19. And of course, this one's called First John. And the way they did this is just so weird. Because there's a book of John, but it's not First John. Okay, First John's actually the second John. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. I didn't number the Bible. Okay, someone else did that. Don't blame me. So we got First John and then chapter 3. We're going to read verses 19 to 24. Here we go. This is how we know that we belong to the truth. 
And this is how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we keep his commands and do what pleases him. And this is his command, to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he's commanded us. The one who keeps God's commands lives in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. Now, there's a lot in there today. We're going to break that down verse by verse. First, I want to teach you what we're going to learn. All right? This is the concept that we're going to learn today. God conquers my condemnation and commends my confidence. We're talking about how to get rid of your guilt, right? How to feel at peace in God's presence. Well, he conquers your condemnation. Conquer means destroy. Condemnation means you feel bad. God's going to conquer the feelings of badness inside of you. And God commends. Commending is like when someone's like, yes, you did it. Yes, it's great. He commends. He's happy about your confidence. So God wants you to be confident. And he doesn't want you to feel condemned. So we're going to say this phrase out loud together. This is what we're going to learn today. This is what you're going to be looking for. Now, we're going to do it in two sections. Oh, two. This is number one. All right, this is number one. God conquers my condemnation. And this is number two. God commends my confidence. Okay, we're going to see both of those in there. Let's say the whole thing together. Ready? God conquers my condemnation and commends my confidence. All right, you're going to see why and how today God conquers your condemnation. And you're going to see how, when he conquers your condemnation, you feel good and he's happy about your confidence. So that's an important thing to remember. Now, we need to take a quick peek at a verse before what we read. We read verses 19 to 24. I'm going to jump back up to verse 6 for a second because I don't want you to misunderstand what he's talking about. He says this, John says this, no one who lives in him, and here he's talking about God, okay? No one who lives in God, no one who really believes in God keeps on sinning. No, no one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. You see this? If you think you know the Lord right here, but you continue to sin, he says you don't know him. That's a big deal. So I don't want anyone to, to get out of today, oh, well, God just doesn't want me to have guilt, so I'm just not going to have any guilt at all. No. In fact, in the Greek language, this, is, this uh, part of the Bible is written in Greek. It says that you cannot miss the mark. Because what we a lot of times think is that, you know, as long as I'm trying hard and as long as I get close, ooh, oh, okay, I better try it again. That wasn't even, okay, I got close that time. That was actually six points or nine, I don't know how to read a dartboard, six points points, right? I scored. I did good, but no. No, the Bible actually says if you miss the mark, if you miss the bullseye, absolute perfection, you're still condemned. See, we think, oh, well, I was close. Oh, I did good. Oh, I did really good. No, God says, hey, if you weren't absolutely perfect in every way, you are still breaking God's law. And this gets confusing because we talk about God being loving and merciful. We want our hearts to be at rest. How could he require absolute perfection from us? That's impossible. He punishes people who don't measure up to this? Well, we're going to see how he can both require perfection and we can be at peace at the same time. So let's look at the very next, or the, the first two verses we read. This is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence, okay? He's going to tell us something. Very important. We want to have rest, okay? And we want to be in the truth, this is how we do it. If our hearts condemn us, because that's a problem, we know that God is greater than our hearts. That's the solution. And he knows everything. So here, when he says our hearts condemn us, if our hearts condemn us, what does it actually mean that our hearts condemn us? In the Greek language, that phrase actually means I've detected something wrong about me. Because it's my heart, and I've detected something wrong. So, so we've got this guilt. I've detected a problem within me. And I'm condemning, because I've looked at pornography. And, and when I looked at it, it felt good. But then when I walked away, it felt like a burden. I'm like, I don't want to do that. It's painful. When I robbed a bank, I got a lot of money. That felt really good. And then later on, I'm like, I shouldn't have done that again. And, and you're struggling with the guilt from your past. 
And even though it was a long time ago, and I've asked God to forgive me. And, oh, I'm a pastor. I shouldn't struggle with guilt anymore. You're thinking, I'm a Christian. I follow Jesus. Why do I still feel so bad about that thing that I've done? You feel bad because you know you didn't hit the bullseye. And so you're carrying around this guilt. You've probably got some things in your past right now that you're completely, 100% done with. You've taken it to God. God has forgiven you. You've repented. But when you remember it, you still feel the burden on your heart. Now, it's important to note, a lot of Christians will say things like, oh, the devil's condemning you. Don't believe the devil. Is that what the Bible says? What, what's condemning you, according to this verse? Our own hearts. You are the reason you feel guilty. You've asked God for forgiveness, and you're not feeling it. So what do you do? Well, look at the, the next part of the verse. It says in, in verse 20, um, if our hearts condemn us, here's the solution. We know that God is greater than what? Our hearts. God is actually greater. So when my heart feels guilt, I say, I'm sorry, but God is a bigger deal than my feelings. God conquers my condemnation. Look at the verse again, just to be clear. He says, we know. Okay, this is a fact. What do we know? That God is greater. What is God greater than? My heart. What does my heart do? Condemns me. But God's bigger than your heart. God's bigger than your feelings of guilt. If you're a Christian, the source of your guilt is not your sin. Jesus already paid for that. The source of your problem is that you haven't completely believed that God has set you free. Once you believe that Jesus went to the cross, died for your sins, and then rose from the dead, you are forgiven. This problem isn't your sin anymore. Jesus repaid for that. You've repented. The sin is gone. The source of the problem is inside of your heart. You need to be believing God all the way. So John says God is bigger than our hearts. We need to recognize when I feel condemned, that's the wrong feeling. My family goes down to Table Rock Lake near Branson quite often, and they have cliffs there that you jump off. Anyone in here ever gone cliff jumping into a lake before? A few of you? Okay, all right. It is, it is really scary, especially the first few times you do it. Like you walk up to the cliff, and it does not feel like a diving board. You're up there, and you're looking down, and you're like, how tall is this? Like 800 feet? And like, it's 12. Nope, no. Nope. Pretty sure it's 800 feet. <laughs> Are the piranhas down there? Like, and Kansas water's all dirty, so like you can't, or Missouri water too, you can't like see down very, very like, are there rocks under there? Am I gonna be like the next lifetime documentary about the kid who dove in and broke his neck? Like, like you don't know, it's scary. And so we pulled up there and we've gone jumping on these rocks a lot of times. And my daughter, Jaden, was seven at the time. She was really small, really super skinny. And, and there's a bunch of teenage boys standing up there. They're all looking over the edge like, I don't know, man, we shouldn't do this. This is scary. I don't know. Well, she's done this a hundred times. So she walks up, little tiny seven-year-old girl, middle teenage boy. She walks up there like this, looks at them, looks at them, then jumps. <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen 16-year-old boys look so condemned in my life. It was amazing. And then they're like, well, we, we got to go now. <laughs> so then they all jump. But man, when you're feeling that condemnation, like they were feeling, when you're feeling that fear, you've got you to see like Jaden did, right? I believe what God says more than I believe my feelings. I believe the truth more than I believe my feelings. Let's write this down. God is greater. He's stronger. He's more merciful than I realize, even though he knows everything wrong I've ever done. And I need to eat this truth up. You have a choice when it comes to guilt for things that you've been forgiven for. You can believe God or you can believe your feelings, but you cannot believe both. God conquers your condemnation. You see the end of that verse there? It said, it said and he knows what? Everything. everything. He knows everything. Yeah. That dark sin you did in that corner that no one ever saw. Every link in the chain. He knows every dang thing you've ever done. And he's forgiven for, he has forgiven you for all of it. He knows every thought you've ever had. And he's forgiven you for all of it. If you've believed. So don't judge yourself for something the judge has already forgiven. Don't judge yourself for something the judge has already forgiven. And accept that. And when you accept that, you no longer feel condemned. Right? Hey, you, I used to carry these chains around, but God, thank you for forgiving me. I believe that you're greater than my feelings. You've really forgiven me, and I am free. Yes! That's amazing. And when you do that, something amazing happens. You know what the next verse says? That's my daughter. It's not a Bible verse. The next verse says, 
Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God. So when you're not feeling guilt anymore and you're not carrying this around anymore, then you're like, hey, I can go talk to God because he's forgiven me and there's nothing holding me back from standing in the presence of God. I have confidence and it's a great place to be. Well, maybe, maybe. Because if you have not chosen to follow Jesus yet, I need you to hear this. John said, we already read this verse once, it's verse six. No one who lives in God keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. You can't just say, oh yeah, well I sinned, but it's no big deal. No, you need to be fighting your sin. You need to be waging war on your sin if you want God to set you free. The next uh, few verses later in verse 14, he says, anyone who does not love remains in death. You need to be loving people in the church. You need to be loving people around you. So John's saying, hey, if you're loving people, if you're loving those in the church, if you're waging war against your sin, whew, then God will set you free. He is not talking to people who say, oh yeah, God's fine with my sin. It ain't no a big deal. I don't, I don't feel bad because God's fine with it. We're not talking to those people. Those people should feel guilty, shouldn't they? Because if you've just accepted your sin as part of your life, you've got a problem. We're also not talking to the Pharisees. These are super religious people who they look good on the outside, but on the inside, they're corrupt. You've got to fight against your sin. You've got to genuinely love people. So, so when John says, hey, if your heart doesn't condemn you, we have confidence before God, how can our hearts not condemn us if we know that we missed the mark? It's all about remembering who God is and how he's forgiven us and fighting your sin at the same time. These three ideas. Let's write this down. My heart won't condemn me if I, A, fully believe and receive the forgiveness from God, and B, if I'm waging war on the sin in my life. Are you ever going to be perfect? No, probably not. But if you're a genuine follower of Jesus Christ, you're waging war on your sin and you're not accepting it anymore. When you screw up, you're not like, well, you know, that's just how it is. <laughs> no. <laughs> you're like, man, I screwed up again. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do whatever I have to do to kill that sin, get it out of my life. And when you fright your sin, when you destroy it, you get confidence to go fight the next sin that shows up in your life. And you're winning the war. And as you're winning the war and believing God's forgiven you, something crazy happens inside of you. You get this confidence to come in front of God because you're like, God, I'm fighting my sin. I believe you've forgiven me. And I am right here now in your presence and I'm feeling good about it. Some people pray all week like, oh God, you know, please, uh, thank you. Um, please be nice to me. God. Like, what is that? And some people pray like, God, I'm asking you to heal my brother right now today. Why? Because they have confidence because their hearts aren't condemning them. Or they believe God has really forgiven them and they're waging war on their sin. And then, then look at the rest of this verse. Okay, this is the same verse, just more of it. If our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him I wanted to yell at this part, but I couldn't yell loud enough, okay? You receive from him anything you ask. Some people go, hey, don't say that. It's there. If our hearts don't condemn us, we receive anything from him we ask. Anything we ask. You've probably seen some people in your life, whatever they pray for, it just happens. And you've thought, why doesn't God answer my prayers? This is why. Because they completely believe that God has forgiven them. They've let go of every shred of guilt because God's greater than their feelings. They don't have that guilt anymore. They're not caring. And they're out there waging war against every sin of theirs that they encounter. And that gives them confidence. So they're charging forward, asking God to answer their prayers. And God's like, yes, yes, God likes confidence. This is why we're saying God conquers my condemnation and commends my confidence. Let's write this down. Genuine confidence in Christ results in confidently bold prayer life. And God answers those prayers of mine. God conquers my condemnation. He commends my confidence. Sometimes my, my kids will come home 
because I got a nice report card. And they're all confident. Dad, do you see I got straight A's right now? And I'm like, yeah, that's good. They're like, ice cream, right? And, and if I'm like, no, we're not going to good ice cream, they're like, excuse me. I asked, did you see my report card? And they've got like this crazy confidence that makes me like want to give them the ice cream, right? But when they got bad grades, none of them have ever come to me and be like, so, did you see the D I got in science? How about ice cream? <laughs> that, is, that has never happened. Why? Because they're condemned. When you're not condemned, you're feeling confident, you approach God boldly. It's a different feeling. So when you approach God boldly, you're not like, well, God, you know, maybe my boss is not really nice and like, that's not good. So maybe do something. No, no. You're like, Lord, this job isn't working for me anymore. My boss is treating me unjustly. So Lord, I'm asking you to fire him. And if you're not going to fire him, then change him or change me. But this cannot remain the same, Lord. Right? That's a way different. And some of you right now are thinking, you can't say that to God. Are you still feeling a little bit of guilt in your life, maybe? Because confident prayer sounds different. In fact, on your outline, it says confident prayer looks like. And I'm going to read from Matthew chapter 15. And in Matthew chapter 15, there's a story that I want you to write some, some of your own notes from. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman. Now, Jesus was a Jew. Canaanites were the enemies of the Jews. These people hated each other. This Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to Jesus, crying out. She's like praying. She's asking Jesus to help her. Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession. <coughs> did Jesus answer? No, look, Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away. She's our enemy. She keeps crying out after us. He answered to her, she's talking to her now, I'm sorry, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel, not you Canaanites. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. Right? He's like, get away. She comes, he comes even closer. He replied, it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Yes, Lord, she said, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Jesus answered, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted, and her daughter was healed from that very hour. Now, what are you going to write down from this story about confident prayer? This lady is bold, isn't she? She's got passion for her child who she wants healing for. And she tells Jesus, basically, I'm sorry, but your answer is not good enough. Have you ever told God that? Because she comes asking him, he does not answer. And instead of going, well, I guess it's a no, and walking away, she goes, hey, you didn't hear me. I'm asking you. And the disciples are like, get out of here. And instead of leaving, she comes closer. And she says, please heal my child. And Jesus says, no. He goes, I'm not taking food for the children, and I'm not giving it to the dogs. And she goes, throw me a bone. <laughs> right? She's like, you got to give me something. She just won't stop. And so what does Jesus do? You have great faith. He compliments her. He likes her confidence. God likes confident, bold prayer. He is not intimidated by you in the least. So when you come to him boldly, he is not intimidated. He is impressed. He likes it when you have released your guilt, accepted his forgiveness, and realized he's the God of the universe. You're like, you can do anything. So in John 3, 21 and 22, we, we're going to read more of this verse here. Dear friends... If, okay, this is the condition, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and we receive from him anything we ask because we keep his commands and do what pleases him. So if and because are important words here, aren't they? These are conditional words. God's going to answer your prayer and set you free from your guilt if and because. If what? If our hearts don't condemn us. Okay, so you fully believe God's forgiven you. And because you keep his commands. Now, he's got a very specific command in mind when John says this. In the very next verse, he says, and this is his command. You right? To believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commands. This is it right here. You have to believe that Jesus Christ lived, died, and rose from the dead. You have sinned and offended God. You have missed the mark. 
And Jesus went to the cross as a sacrifice for your sins. This is why we don't have to be condemned, because we deserve to be condemned, but Jesus was condemned on our behalf. And when you believe that Jesus went to the cross and died for your sins, paid your bill, and then he rose from the dead to prove that he could do it and that he was Lord of life and death, when you believe in that, you gain freedom. God it gives you forgiveness. It's a free gift that you find in Jesus Christ by believing in him. And when you get that, you're free. You have no condemnation. And then you start to love people in the church and, and you start to change the way you live. Now listen, friends, if you have never given your life to Jesus Christ before, maybe you've thought, yeah, I should do that or whatever, but, but you've never really given your life to Christ. There's a red card in the chair around you. I want you to fill that out. I want you to mark that you're giving your life to Jesus. I want to know when you put it in that red box that you are doing this for real. There's no such thing as a quiet, closet Christian. I don't mean that every Christian has to be walking around yelling and being obnoxious. I mean, there's no such thing as a Christian who goes, well, you know, I've not said it, but like, I believe. No. Every one of us is bold. Just like we go to God boldly, we boldly state, I'm going to follow Jesus from now on. You make that decision today and you make it boldly. And then we're going to make this real practical. So how do we get God to, to answer anything we ask by believing and loving each other. And on your outline, there's a grid called Galatians 5 grid. Now, we have to believe that God has forgiven us. But if we keep re-engaging in the same sins over and over and over, you're not going to feel the freedom that you should feel. Right. Is this making sense? So we've got to fight this sin. Galatians chapter 5 in the Bible gives us a list of sins that says if you're doing these things, you're not going to be saved. It's a big deal. And so what I want you to do is you take that when you're starting to feel condemned and eventually you can do this in your head, but at least do it on paper once or twice. Like if you say, okay, am I dealing with sexual immorality or impurity? Maybe you're having sex outside of marriage. Okay, you're, you've got a problem here. Maybe you're looking at pornography. You've got a problem there. So, so when I was looking at pornography, I said, what I got to do about that? I installed this thing called Ever Accountable on my phone. It's this app that tracks all my text messages, all the websites I go to, all the YouTube videos I watch, and it sends a list of it to three accountability partners of your choosing. I'll tell you what, if you're like, I just can't stop looking at porn, let three people know every website you go to, and you'll stop pretty quick. <laughs> Can you deal with it? What is that called? This is called waging war on your sin. Right? I'm not messing with it anymore. And if still that doesn't, that doesn't stop, then you just go ahead and you get yourself a dumb phone. All right? You, you do whatever it takes. You wage war. You kill the enemy. And you just go through each thing. How am I going to fight this battle? You get down at the bottom. You got a, a line that says, how am I loving people? Like, uh, I would write down, my wife and I, we, we did foster care. And, and maybe you can write down, like, I'm bringing dinner to people in the church who are in the hospital or are struggling financially. And how are you showing love to your brothers and sisters in Christ? Because if you're not doing that and you're engaging in sin, you're going to feel condemnation. But you're going to wage war on your sin. You're going to show love to people here. When you're showing love and you're fighting your sin and you're believing God has set you free, you're going to feel real bold. It's going to feel different and it's good. So as long as you're doing that, you're going to feel less guilt. Now, I want to see if there's any questions that came in here. Okay, someone says, sometimes when I feel guilt for my past sins that I've confessed and been forgiven for, I have hope in remembering that God says I am no longer chained up in my sins. It's hard at times to get past my own feelings, but the freedom is incredible. Yeah, right? Like you just, you have to remember that God is greater than your feelings. You have to. Someone says, please put a tip guard or something on that sword. I don't need to be sliced up. This must have been someone from the first couple rows. All right. <laughs> um... This person says, if we hold on to guilt after Jesus says we're free, it's kind of like telling Jesus we know better than him. Right? Right? Man. I often feel like I've dropped those chains onto the floor, but it caught part of my pant leg and I'm still dragging it behind me. <laughs> right? Like it's, like it's toilet paper stuck to you. And, you know, if we do that, if we do that, we, we have to recognize that 
I haven't, com- I haven't fully accepted that God is greater than my feelings, right? I still got some of those feelings. And don't, I mean, we all do it at times. Right? I've got, when I recognize it's stuck to my foot, okay, God, I believe you 1,000%. I am totally free of this. So I don't accept this, God. Help me. And actually, actually, we've got a practical application that will help you with this. It's the next one. So Psalm 116. When I feel condemned, I will go through the Galatians 5 grid and make sure that I'm waging war on my sin. I don't want you to feel good about yourself unless you're actually fighting your sin. And I haven't accepted it. If that's true, I'll read and pray Psalm 116. You know, I want you to do it loudly, and I want you to accept the truth that God is greater than my self-condemnation. Okay, Psalm 116. What am I talking about here? A lot of years ago, when we had three foster kids who thought we were going to adopt, and, and the agency just, just took them away. I was broken. I was laying in bed. I opened up to the book of Psalms, because the Psalms are like poems and prayers and songs. And it's opened up to that book. I didn't know what to say to God. And all I could do was look through that and go, if it's in here, I can say it to you. So I just started reading out loud some of the Psalms that explained how I felt. And I got loud and I was praying and God answered my prayers and it changed my life. Today, like I will sometimes wake up at three in the morning going, oh, the building project for our church. Like we still got to pay for stuff and like how are we going to pay for stuff? And we still, I got to finish these details and I'm freaking out. And so I'll open up the book of Psalms and, and when I read in the Psalms, okay, this is what I feel, God, and I will say it to God. So when you're feeling condemnation, I want you to open up the book of Psalms. Maybe 116, maybe others, but in 116, if you're, if you're feeling guilty, you go, okay, God, I I feel guilty for my sin, but I love the Lord for he heard my voice. You're telling yourself, okay, God heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. God has heard from my cry for mercy. I am free. He has been merciful. He's forgiven me because he turned his ear to me. I will call on him as long as I live. Yes, God, I'm going to call on you for the rest of my life because you have healed me. I believe it. The cords of death entangled me. The anguish of the grave overcame me or came over me. Yeah, God, I was feeling really guilty. I was feeling out of touch with you. I had distress and sorrow, but then I called on the name of the Lord. I'm calling you right now, God. And I said, Lord, save me. And the Lord, you are, you are gracious, you're righteous, you're full of compassion. The Lord protects you. And where, when I was brought low, he saved me. Thank you for saving me. I'm letting go of the guilt now, God. And then you can talk to yourself. Return to your rest, my soul. Return to your rest, my soul. Lord has been good to you. Do you see how that sort of thinking is much better than I'm such a bad person? I'll never get better. Feel so guilty. No, we want to take what the Lord says about us and we want to apply that to our situation, not what our heart says, because our hearts want to condemn us, but God's greater than our hearts. So go to God's word and let his word teach you how to feel about your sin. Then once you don't feel condemned about your sin anymore and your heart doesn't condemn you, then you move forward. Next practical application. When I don't feel condemned, I'll make sure I haven't deceived myself. Okay, you're going you're gonna to go to that Galatians 5 grid and make sure you're really waging war on your sin. And if I haven't deceived myself, then I'll move into confident prayer with intensity. I will even try to increase the time I spend and my soul's engagement in prayer. Perhaps a prayer journal an accountability partner, or some other method of keeping focus is a good idea. So literally, God wants to answer your prayers. Right? That, that's what he said, right? In 1 John chapter 3, we receive from him anything we ask. That's what it said, right? Yes. Right? So pray with intensity. What does it look like? Well, it don't look like falling asleep while you pray. It doesn't look like forgetting to pray. Forgetting to pray? I don't want to make you feel bad, but come on, people. Are you serious right now? If your boss came to you and was like, hey, I'm going to triple your salary. I'm going to give you a bonus of $300,000 if you put in 80 hours this week and double your production. You'd be like, I'll be there 100 hours. <laughs> Wouldn't you? You would not forget, and you would not fall asleep. You would do whatever it takes. And you have access to the God of the universe who can do much more than that, don't you? We will not forget to pray. God says he wants to do anything we ask. You've got his attention. So give him your attention. Pray boldly. Someone says, it's important to remember that uh, even in confident prayer, God may not answer the way we want. Do 
Do not base your life on the exception instead of the rule. What did God say in 1 John chapter 3? He said, when you have this boldness to go to God because you don't have guilt and God will answer and give you anything you ask. That's what it said in the Bible, right? I'm sorry, I'm a preacher. I can't tell you anything other than what scripture tells you, which is God says anything. Jesus also said, if you believe, you can say to this mountain, be thrown into the sea and it will do it. Jesus said that, didn't he? Elsewhere in scripture, it says, believe and you will receive. Now, I'm not a health and wealth preacher, but I'm sorry. The Bible says when we ask for these things, God will answer us. Now, I've done a sermon called Seven Reasons God Hasn't Answered Your Prayer. There are some reasons why God won't answer your prayer. For instance, it says, if you're a husband, but you're not treating your wife well, good chance God's not going to answer your prayer. That is his daughter, and you treating his daughter like crap is not going to go well with him. God says, if you've accepted your sin as normal and you just keep doing it and you don't really care, God's not going to listen to your prayers, right? There's like seven reasons God wouldn't listen to your prayer. You need, but when we re- accept God's forgiveness, we remove the sin from life, we're waging war on it and we're following Jesus and we're bold in front of God, we just keep going back to him, right? The, the Canaanite lady, God didn't answer her prayer right away. So what did she do? She came back. And he said, no. And she said, that is not an answer I want to accept. So does God ever say no? I can think of two times in the Bible where God told someone no after they gave him a request. One was Moses when he said, I don't want to do this job you gave me. And God was like, sorry, tough luck. And Paul, when Paul said, there's a thorn in my flesh and I want you to remove it. And God said, no, I want you to learn that I'm enough for you. So, Is it possible that God will say no to your request? Yes, but that should be the exception, not the rule. There are far too many Christians who think, well, God just said no, and they move on with their life thinking that's just how it is. Stop it! The vast majority of things we read in Scripture about prayer says if you really come with boldness and belief, God is going to answer your prayer. I got a prayer journal. It's over 200 pages now. And I've got, I don't know, maybe out of the hundreds and, and there's like multiple prayers per page. So I don't know, maybe a thousand prayer requests. I've got like maybe 12 or 15 that have not been answered. I keep track of them, all right? Answered or not answered. Like we should think of God not answering our prayer as the exception, not the rule. Does that make sense, everybody? And when you live like that and you live boldly and you keep coming to God until he answers, you're going to see God do things that you never would have expected before. In fact, I think, I think a prayer journal can be an important thing. Because if you're like me, you know, I got, I got ADHD, okay? And so I, I don't always remember what I'm talking about in the middle of the moment. Like sometimes I'll be preaching and I'll be like, yo, listen, this is what God says. God says that. Does she got two buns on her head right now? Two of them. And then I'm like, oh, wait, I am preaching right now. And that's why God says that. You know, like, so if I'm ever preaching and you're like, why did Jesus pause for two seconds? You'd be like, oh, his mind went somewhere else for a minute. Okay, that's just what happens. Who's with me on that sort of thing? Yeah? All right, right? So I write it down because when I write my prayers down, I'm like, oh, yeah, this is what I'm talking about. I remember now. But you got to keep it short. My prayer was not like 30 pages long. My prayer was like, God, I've decided to pray about what I'm going to preach on. Help me to know what to preach on this week. It's small, it's simple, it's easy. In fact, if If your prayer is 20 pages long, it's possible you're doing it wrong. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 6. When you pray, do not keep babbling like pagans, for they think they'll be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Hey, uh, super mature Christians, sometimes you're the ones who need to work on this. Because when you first came to Christ, you were like, God, my car broke and so am I. Help! And now you're like, Father in heaven, I beseech thee for my automobile. (laughs) Send your angels from heaven to surround it on the side and the other side and the bottom and the top. Sit in the driver's seat and the passenger seat, but not in the back. That's embarrassing. My kids sit back there. There's lots of hamburgers from like last month. (laughs) But send your angels to lift the car up. Oh, 2,428 pounds of the car, Lord. Fill the gas tank, not with 87, but 89, Lord. (laughs) No. 92. <laughs> God, I put it in your hands and I'm like, like, shut up. Like God, Jesus is up there. He's like, I know what you're talking about. Get to the point. You ain't got no money. <laughs> All right. So like, it doesn't have to be long and eloquent and don't get me wrong. Like if you want to spend time with the Lord and pour your feelings out to him, that's okay. 
But don't think that just because you're talking a lot, he's going to answer. Because what did he say in chapter 6, verse 7? When you pray, do not keep babbling like pagans. He's like, you can come to me and you can say it and you can say it boldly, but you don't need to say it a long time. Let's write this down. In fact, when I pray, I don't need to say a lot, but I need to say it boldly. I'm going to say this again. I want you to say boldly. Okay. When I pray, I don't need to say a lot, but I need to say it boldly. Could you imagine this week? Instead of having doubt, you believe God completely that he's forgiven you. You get rid of the chains. And instead of the chains, you've got a sword because you're fighting your sin. You're waging war on it. You're going to kill it. And instead of thinking, I'm a bad Christian, you're like, God has forgiven me and I'm fighting my sin. And you are now confident in front of God. Could you imagine that you and the person in front of you, maybe the whole row behind you, you all start praying like crazy. And 20, 30 people in this church are praying like they've never prayed before. God's going to do some crazy stuff isn't he? Could you imagine if like all 500 of us started praying like that? I think not only our church would feel different, I think this whole town would feel different. Go to God with boldness. I can't wait to see you battle this week. Let's pray. Lord God, we love you and we thank you for loving us too. Thank you for giving us the ability to come before your throne, not because we deserve it, but because you have forgiven us completely. Help us to fight our sin. Help us to believe completely that we are free from our guilt. Thank you for being stronger than our hearts. In Jesus' name, help everyone here to be able to come to you with boldness, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.